Okay. Hey, I just want to welcome everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series presented by BioSteel and Pure Hockey. Uh, really excited for the guests all week, but especially for today, uh, we have Stuart Armstrong, who is uh, head of coaching for Sport England and also the host of the Talent Equation um, podcast. So he has 142 episodes. I've listened to everyone probably a couple of times, most of them. They're great, great stuff. Um, and, you know, he's a guy that, you know, for me personally, I look to as a mentor and, and, and the stuff that he does, it just, you know, it's so practical, so, um, so deep that he talks about, but trying to incorporate into my, my coaching. So really happy to have you here, Stuart. Um, just want to welcome you. I'm, um, well, I'm delighted to be here, Dave. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting to be on the receiving end because uh, ordinarily I'm, I'm hosting you and we're having a chat. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's great, it's great to be here. Great to be with my, with my friends um, from, uh, from uh, over the water. Uh, we both, we both involved in sports with sticks. Uh, I have to run around. You guys can glide about and look graceful. So uh, it's a slightly uh -huh. different context. But uh, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to the chat. And I'm really impressed that you counted up all the episodes because I don't number them. So the fact you know that there's 142, that's news to me. So that's really, that's really cool. <laughs> hey, that's what a good host does. They have to look <laughs> into uh, and find like and dig deep. So we also have our technical director for the ADM, uh, Ken Martell on. Um, so Ken is, works out of Colorado Springs and he's been with uh, USA Hockey for quite a number of years. And I uh, just want to welcome you too, Ken. Thanks, Dave. So just want to get started here. And, um, you know, I, I said that you, you host the Talent Equation, but also head of coaching for Sport England. But you have a varied background with lots of different um, sports and different ways within England. Can you talk me through how you got started and when you started, you know, working as a, as a coach and how that all progressed? Um, well, uh, I guess, how did I start getting involved as a coach? Well, I guess I'm, I'm one, of the, one of these kids that, like, and like just started getting really interested into sport and just wanted to play every single sport um and you know i if i saw it on tv i wanted to play it and not only did i want to play it i wanted to find out how to be really good at it or as good as i could be at it um so like you know we nba came on tv over here started playing basketball played for played at club level half decent point guard considering i can't jump um, but you know, uh, like to think I can handle a, handle a ball, uh, played American football as well. Um, I'm like the world's slowest wide receiver and cornerback. So basically they should run me on the little inside routes and just get pummeled by linebackers. Didn't last long, but, uh, I, I really loved playing the game. We used to play at school all the time. Um, and I played a whole range of different sports. If it was on TV, I was going to play it. And what I always do in trying to learn to get better at it was I design little games to play. Um, and so, um, any of the games that I'm involved with, you know, I play a lot of cricket, played a lot of football, played a lot of uh, rugby, hockey, everything else. It was always about playing little small games against my brother or with my friends and creating leagues and all those sorts of things. And that's kind of where it started. I think that's where my kind of interest in getting better at sport became. I was born with a disability as well. And because I uh, had some uh, limitations in my feet, it also made me sort of like I had to adapt a little bit. So I became really kind of astute. So I played international field hockey and uh, as a junior. And, you know, if you're not fast, which I'm not, um, your options are pretty limited. So what you've got to do is you've got to think quicker. You've got to be more tactically astute. You've got to work out who around you can help you. You've got to work out what they're doing ahead of time. So I became kind of like analytical about the game. And that took me into kind of a bit of a journey of coaching. But my career... Uh, in sport came about I actually wanted to be a graphic designer I was really into drawing and my art teacher caught me on the field hockey pitch for the 15th time instead of being in his art class and he said you should have a career in sport son and that proved to be the best career advice I was given and so that's how I ended up on my career journey and before you worked for Sport England you were working for UK coaching is that before Sport England, I was actually with rugby. I was mm -hmm. with rugby for England rugby for about th uh, three and a half years. I was their uh, player pathways uh, manager. So I was looking at kind of right from kind of mini rugby all the way through to sort of the base level of the talent pathway and moving into the professional game and trying to create the kind of journey and the pathways there and almost looking at what does what does the entry point to the game look like and how can we reimagine it for different people with different sets of needs. Um, and, um, and then prior to that, I had a good stint of time, good eight, nine years working in golf. Um, and, um, looking at, I devised a game called try golf, which is like a primary entry game, uh, which, you know, is soft and it's, you can play with 30 kids in a small area and get the ball in the air. And so I guess I've always been designing 
game forms to help people get involved in and get excited about a game and then and then helping them sort of be be involved i even had a little period for about 18 months working in the private sector i worked for a company called powerplay golf that was trying to create like this short form nine hole game that had two flags on every green it was really super exciting we lasted about a year and then uh, a whole load of things happened and it kind of fell apart, but it was a really, really good piece, good time. So I've always been into the kind of innovation side of sport and trying to find new ways to play and new exciting approaches. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely been my career path so far. Well, I think yeah, that's one of the things that we appreciate so much about your background is that you've, you've had experience with so many different sports um, at, at a variety of levels. And you're, you've done such a good job of sharing information. You've created communities of practice. Uh, you know, I think you've been a real leader in this space for not just those in your country, but I think really for, for a lot of us around the globe. Well, I, I feel very honored to hear you say that, Ken, I have to say. I, I guess it's one of those things where um, some, some years ago, sort of the birth of the internet, again, you know, pretty, not, well, not the birth of the internet, because that sounds like I'm going really far back, but, um, but you know, I, I got really into blogging. And the reason I got into blogging, actually, was I was on my coaching journey. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, you know, uh, reflection was a really important thing. And I'm a little bit lazy by nature. So I'm kind of always want to try and do two things at the same time. So I thought, well, if I'm going to document my reflections, what I may as well do is is write down what I'm reading and learning and share it with other people. So I started a blogger account and started to talk and then lo and behold, people started to listen, like read it and like comment and ask me questions. And I'm like, well, I don't know. And then, and then it built from there. And I've, I've loved podcasts forever. Right. And I, I've been wanting to start a podcast for so many years and I've so it's run out of time and it's difficult and technical. And then starting the podcast again, in some respects was a little bit of a, was a partly about, I'd, I'd really like to have some more conversations with people about coaching. And it struck me that the, the way to get them on was to say it was for a podcast. So that's kind of how I was able to get people like your good self on to mm -hmm. come and talk to me and, and have some really fascinating. So it's been a fantastic journey of learning. Um, and I just believe that the whole, if the whole of the coaching community took it upon themselves to share just one thing a year with somebody else publicly, a reflection, a, a, a blog, a journal, an article, whatever it might be, what a great place we'd be in, you know, that kind of whole peer support world. And I suppose that's the mission to try and encourage more of that to happen. Well, I mentioned to Dave that I was going to ask you this ahead of time, but they, my first experience with Stuart Armstrong was stumbling across one of your podcasts. And it was right through a time frame where it was the Stuart Armstrong's personal war on drills. And that kind of hit a, a tone with, with us because we were going through the same you know, same thing, kind of looking at our sport, how it was being delivered. Was it fun for kids? And was it productive for kids? You know, were they gaining hockey sense and the ability to play and those things? So that really resonated with us. So could you explain a little bit about the Stuart Armstrong personal war on drills? Because I think that's an underlying theme that you've continued with. Uh, yeah, I think it'll probably end up being on my uh, gravestone, probably. In fact, I'm, I'm not sure if I've got it. Oh, yeah, I've got the I've got the merch with the Ditch Those Drills nice. merchandise on the nice. back. Where can we buy one of those? Uh, yeah, it's a limited edition at the moment, but okay, it's, watch, right. the, watch, watch this space. It's coming out soon, hopefully. I've just got to find the right supply chains, which aren't easy at the moment. <laughs> no, no, not a bit. <laughs> um, but um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so when did it start? Well, that was the very early days of the podcast. And if I remember mm -hmm. rightly, the very first War on Drills episode was me actually walking from the train mm -hmm. station to my office. Mm -hmm. And it was really, I guess, the start of, uh, this has been on my mind for a long time. I need to sort of write this down. This is kind of a good thing to start with. I'll start with a, a, a bit of a kind of personal rant about what I don't like about or what, why I think we need to move away from drills. But the, the, the embers of that, where it started from, was quite a lot a number of years earlier well several years earlier so I mentioned to you at the start that as a child I we played games right so we were the classic backyard games kids right our driveways we we named them after famous cricket pitches in the world right because they all had different characteristics and we had different rules for different driveways because they had different characteristics um we invented golf courses around our gardens using like you know the airflow balls and stuff like that you know it was all about games if we were practicing i'd try and make it more difficult for myself by using like a thinner bat and all that sort of stuff so i was kind of doing a constraints type approach um before i even obviously you'd ever heard of a constraints type approach but you know it's modifications and trying to improve 
Um, and and quite a lot of self-taught stuff as well. Yeah, I had some coaches, but most of the time was on. We were just you know spend all day long in the you know in the practice areas and playing games and creating. And my abiding childhood memory, right, is you know it being so like disappointing when your parents called you in for dinner like it's or when you you knew you had to go home because it was dark and it's like we can't play anymore we tried all sorts to try and keep playing but you just couldn't see so you had to go home and it's so like disappointing because the game is so it's so kind of um absorbing and you know there's no better game in the world than a 29 all game of soccer or something along those lines right so that's my childhood Hmm. and then i entered the world of coaching and i learned about coaching and i learned how to do it properly and what I learned about doing it properly was that we had to use this process where you went by you break everything down into its bite-sized component chunks and you work on the technique and then you develop your technique and then you apply it in a game and if you're lucky you get a game and then you know and I'm like and I I'm doing that and a little part of me is just feeling uh but oh it's the proper way to do it so you know Mm you've got to follow the path so I double down on it right and then I start my coaching. I get a bit of success, right? Working with some men's teams, national level, doing some decent stuff. But I'm finding myself equally, something inside me is a bit um, not sure about this. And then what I found myself becoming was not really very nice. And, you know, I was getting quite agitated. I would be quite aggressive. I'd be mm-hmm. quite uh, on the sidelines. I'd be very vocal. Um and, you know, we do lots and lots of super high level, super detailed, you know, like proper, I mean, artistically detailed, <laughs> repetitive pattern stuff, right? You yes. follow that move and that move. And we were, we were like, you know, really super organized. And that gets you so far. And then you come up against an, a team that just works it out and they know how to deal with you. And the team can't deal with that because they've got a pattern that they follow and they can't do anything else and then you find yourself like you know missing out on a league championship by like three points and it was just down to that one or two games and you know what's going on so i started looking for answers because i I was you know i was doubling down you know if 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 we didn't win we need more structure not less more so more 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 and each time there's a little part of me, I felt like there's a little part of me that was just dying inside. Like my little part of my soul was being torn out of me because it's not what I was as a child. And it's not what I enjoyed as a child. I didn't really enjoy doing it as a coach, but I didn't really see an alternative. It was the only option. And then, so I start looking around and a really famous field hockey coach, like super, super famous and like successful Australian field hockey coach called Rick Charlesworth. Like he, he, he coached a hockey ruse, like a female Uh, field hockey side they were all conquering right beat everybody for years multiple gold medals and he talked about this thing called designer games and I heard the word games and thought hello there's something in here and that took me on a journey towards teaching games for understanding game sense um, and a range of other different things and this was sort of pre you know every loads of information being available to everybody in the palm of their hand this was like had to go to a like a library and get a book and, and get it out and read it or buy it. And you remember that, you know, we had mm. to do that. So, um, th- you know, yeah, yeah. So you're digging around in all this stuff and like, and then so, so I start playing around with it and I'm like in the, you know, in the, oh, I don't, start doing, but I like the idea of it. Right. And so for a long time, I thought I was doing a really good games based approach. Turns out I wasn't, I was doing like a hybrid horrible version that I neither here nor there. Then I get fortunate. Right. So through my career, I've met some fantastically interesting people, people like Rick Shuttleworth, people like Keith Davids, people like Russell Earnshaw and all these sorts of stuff. And they absolutely turn my view, my worldview upside down. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, my God, what the hell have I been doing for 20 years? I'm sorry to anybody who came across me. And I say that quite regularly. So that's it, really. That's the kind of, you know, this is who I am. This is kind of what I was about as a child. This is what I think children are looking for in their experiences. We're then saying, no, 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 we're going to make it a bit more like school for you because it's got to be done properly and I'm thinking to myself what kind of world can that be if we're trying to you know tackle inactivity and we're trying to encourage people to do more and more sport physical activity we've got to get a love going and part of the love comes from the play and the game and so that's why I'm so passionate about it. I think you know for our staff we're a bit on the same journey where a lot of us our backgrounds were in high performance sport and you know we all said we valued this game sense that 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 player that was creative 
Yet then when you take a step back and you look at what we do in practice and you, you scratch your head and say, well, well, wait a second, this doesn't seem to be encouraging that because everything is scripted. Everything is, is a pattern. And then when our players don't play with creativity, you're like, well, isn't that our fault? I mean, at some level, we have to take responsibility because we've been putting the kids into these drills and, and, and working in that manner. So I think for a lot of us and our staff, it, it's the self-realization that it wasn't going like we wanted. So at some level, you got to turn around and look in the mirror and go like, well, what, what, what can I be doing here? What, what more can we be? And should we be operating differently? And then when you start looking around and exposed to more things, that's uh, you know, there's a big world out there. So one, one of the things that, I mean, I'll talk about when we start, when I start talking about slides, but one of the things that I, I was really key to, to keen to explain to people, because needless to say, I didn't expect the kind of response I got from the war on drills. Um, I thought, you know, I, I wanted to pique some interest and I, mm -hmm. I guess it was a little bit of clickbait, I guess, you know, is it, I wanted to get people to think, what the hell is this guy talking about? I wanted to stimulate a debate, right? Um, right. What I didn't realize was it was going to follow me around for the, for the next 10 years. Um, but one of the things I want to be clear about is kind of like, what is a drill? Because we use the word drill, right, yeah. as um, to mean a lot of different things. It means a lot of different things for a lot of people. Like any kind of exercise or practice is a drill mm -hmm. to, a, to some people, right? I categorize drills very, very specifically, right? I think they're one small component and actually, in fact, will, you know, can go through a typology of different practice activities that actually define the way we might do this. We might explore that a little bit later on. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that I think I see a drill as being something very, very isolated, you know, kind of very much about cues, waiting their turn. You know, um, usually, you know, there's no other opponent. You're just literally kind of following a pattern or going around some cones or pylons or whatever it might be. And that I consider to be a kind of a drill. Yeah. And then anything you do beyond a drill, you're starting to move more towards a game. And actually, you can gamify drills quite easily, and therefore, you can almost make them much more interesting immediately. So, I just wanted to be clear about that before we start. Yeah, no, I think we, that's the same sort of definition that we we use internally here at USA Hockey. Uh, all decisions have been made ahead of time yeah. for the player. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so Stu, I want you, you know, kind of going on the games and working with your athletes, I want you to talk about your development journey with your, your players, you know, not giving them all the answers and having, letting them make decisions, kind of what Ken was talking about um, before we kind of get going. Well, it's a pretty challenging thing, right? So you obviously, you've done it this way for a long time and that's what you know. And then all of a sudden you realize that that's actually not only potentially counterproductive, well, not only counterproductive from what you're trying to achieve, but actually it's, also can be quite um, challenging for the individuals. And certainly for me, it was an easy decision to make because I would just felt this sense that that was, that was wrong. But then you're in the wilderness then, aren't you? Because you go, I've always known this and now I've got to do something else. And now I've got to start and it's like a leap of faith and it's almost like starting again, beginning again. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went through a period of what I call the wilderness years. And I also went through a period of proper, what I call experimentation. And there was no one to talk to. It's another reason why I'm so passionate about the podcast and the communities of learning and all the other opportunities, because I didn't have any of that. I was just mm -hmm. working through stuff myself, very much in the wilderness, trying to work it through, trying to find different ways of approaching these different things. And, um, and I guess, you know, I had players who were just prepared to come with me on the journey. Um, but what I found was I got this really interesting response. So initially it was a little bit like, what the hell's going on? What are you doing? Why are you not talking to us anymore? Why aren't you saying anything? Why are we just playing games? Why aren't we doing all that? Why aren't we just, why aren't you numbering the cones and telling us which one to go to after? Why isn't the color coding happening? Why isn't all this, why does it feel a bit more chaotic? So there was a lot of questions like that. And I had to do what I call selling the why, right? So I had to sort of explain to them all the way through, right? Going through a different journey now. What it's, you know, this is much more about you guys making decisions. This is much more about you guys finding a way through this. We've, we've been too structured, too robotic. We need to find a new way. So we went through that journey together and it wasn't easy. And I, I made some big mistakes through that. You know, I got some relegations and, um, and things like that while I was on that learning journey. And it was a pretty, it was a, it was a difficult period, right? Because I was going through that learning process, but really, really valuable. I learned an awful it's hard lot about- too, right? I mean, you, you're on that, you were- now you go 
the other direction a little bit. Um, you know, that, that the pull maybe for some people and some coaches to just go back to what you were doing, you know? Uh, and many times I thought about it, trust me. And probably a couple of times I did. Um, but because um, you know you don't have got you haven't got any other answers. But again, you know, that's another point where if I just had someone to talk to, you know, I, the answer was right yes. in front of my nose. Yeah. It just took me six weeks to get there when it would have taken me six six minutes. Yeah. So that was the journey, and um, there was trial and error, but it was worth it. And the reason it was worth it was I just kept getting such fantastic feedback, and the feedback wasn't necessarily from the players themselves. I could see the joy. I could see the joy. I felt better. I felt the joy. I went from the period of, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore to, you know, and I just had a little baby as well. And it was a bit like, you know, my wife says to me, really, you're carrying on? I'm a bit like, well, just a couple more years, you know, and then, um, and I kept, so, but, it, but you could see the joy, right? And I could, and I could feel the joy. And I, and I, it's been a long time since I'd felt that joy. But then also I, I found myself um, in a scenario where I could see things happening in front of my eyes that I'd never seen before. And those moments were honestly like, ooh, they were almost a bit addictive because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, wow, look at this happening now. This is different. And that's what kept me coming back. Well, as coaches, that's one of the – you want to help. You want to – you know, that's part of who most coaches are. Like, they, they want to see um, kids having joy. They want to see kids improving. They, they, they want that for the, the kids that they work with. So, you know um, – that's kind of all the crack that we all <laughs> <laughs> crave sometimes, right? I mean, yeah. so you can absolutely get that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the journey I've been on, Dave, um, you know, ups and downs and all that sort of stuff. But I do think now it's, there's, there's greater opportunities for coaches to tap into some of this information and to be able to then learn from each other. There's a better community now. We're more connected than we ever were. We're able to do things like this across thousands of miles if we need to. There's people you can access. There's people prepared to give more time. You know, you guys are doing fabulous work to support your coaches and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and so you don't have to be as on your own as you used to be. Uh, there's far more support to do this. It doesn't have to be such a uh, difficult period. I mean, there's bound to be some 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 challenge because it has to be. That's part of the growth and the learning process. But um, it's not as you're not as on your own, you know. So um, I, I don't I, I make it sound like it's like don't ever do this. This is a nightmare. It's not. It's actually much more rewarding than you think. Cool. That's interesting. So do you want to get started on your presentation or your yeah, small I'll chat? I'll share my screen. Let me just. Uh, I just I just want to remind everybody on YouTube Live and then also on Zoom. Use the chat um, function if you have any questions or any issues with what's going on in terms of technical or whatever. But use the Q and A box if you're on Zoom to answer or ask any questions. And if you're on YouTube Live, just make sure that when when we're on the chat, we're just talking about. What's going on here? We don't need um, stuff talking about who knows what. So I'll be sure to delete any of those comments. And uh, I know some of some people are talking about return to rinks and all that great stuff. But let's just keep it to you know Stuart and what he's doing. So thank you. Okay. Um, you can everybody. I'm assuming you can see that. Yes. 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 Yeah, you're all good. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, what I'm talking about a little bit is I, I actually, interestingly, I got this title from um, some dog trainers, um, and um, we, I've got a, uh, she's a uh, about 14 months old now, little spaniel, and she's one of those what I call naughty but nice dogs. She's like lovely, but every now and again she just like has to run off to either go and be friends with another dog, or particularly if she sees a squirrel, then there's just no stopping her. And I found this podcast called Sexier Than a Squirrel. And, uh, and it's like, wow, that's really interesting. I like the idea of that. And then I found out that basically they do all their dog training through games. I'm like, ha ha, you got me, right? I'm in. And they have this whole thing called, we got a game for that. So all of their training ideas are based around these ideas of games. And it's been interesting because I've been actually following some of the journeys. And uh, as a result of that, um, little Flo, the dog is, um, she's, she's getting there. She's, she's doing some interesting yeah. things. And so we're making some progress. But so I thought I'd use that as a title, but also this is around being about so like your practices and how you can use kind of uh, be really intentional in your practice design and in your games. Um, so when we talk about practice design, I just wanted to share with you this little video. Tell 
don't want to yell. <laughs> now, um, when I, the reason I'm showing you that is it's been doing the rounds on the internet quite a while, quite a lot, but that's basically like every practice I've ever run in my life, or it feels like I have. Because I designed this, night, neat, this nice, neat and tidy, really well organized thing. And then um, the kids find all the ways to break it and use the rules. But actually, what I've learned to understand over the years is that they're the moments you need to live for. They're the moment when the kids are thinking about the game in such a way that they're finding ways to beat your game. Now, you know, you've got people who are you've got you've got young people who are really beginning to think through how they can approach learning and, and what they need to do within their environment to be able to play more effectively. So that was the kind of starting point. So I just want to reflect for a second on this concept of player or athlete centered. And it's a phrase we hear a lot and it's a phrase that people use a lot. Now, in my mind, player centeredness is a bit of a nebulous idea right so people think it's like you're either player centered or you aren't it's not like that right player centeredness is on a spectrum and it and and being athlete or player centered is determined by a range of different factors the capabilities of the individual the task that you have at hand and also the environment in which you're working and so how player centeredness comes across to people um uh, is very much defined by what you're trying to achieve at that moment with those individuals in the space that you're in. Um, and so you need to take those into consideration. And so to be player centered can look and feel very different. You could walk into somebody's space and go, that's not very athlete centered. That's being very command and control. But actually in that moment, it is actually what the athletes are requiring and what they need. And we are as coaches piggy in the middle. We're always trying to match between needs and wants. We want to ensure that the athletes are going to get what they need in order to help them develop and improve and, and then ultimately perform. But at the same time, very few of us have got, you know, if, unless we're in particular environments, very few of us have got um, athletes that, uh, you know, are purely based on the performance outcomes. Most of them are there for fun, for fun enjoyment, uh, participation, be with friends, all those things that, you um, Heather Mannix, who uh, uh, works with you, we, you guys at USA Hockey, talks about as part of her research that she did with Amanda Visek around what makes sport fun for kids. I know she's been on one of your webinars in the last couple of weeks. Unfortunately, I missed it, but I was, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of all the work that they've done. And um, if there was a Nobel Prize for coaching or an equivalent, I'd be up, I'd be nominating them for the research they've done because it's been so useful. Anyway, um, now in the participation realm, it's much more about what the players want. You know, they they if they don't if they're not going to get something that they really want, then they're probably just going to drop out eventually. They might stay for, you know, a, a while, but eventually they're probably going to. And we see you know, we all see dropout rates. So I feel like what we've got to do is we've got to try and make sure that we can find the balance between the two. And the challenge we have sometimes is I think sometimes we're a bit too focused on the performance and the needs and we don't take care of the wants. And so we're trying to find that balancing act. You know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, uh, when I'm uh, uh, making a meal for my children, you know, they'll happily eat what we see on the right hand side of this uh, screen. Uh, they'll see, you know, they'll happily eat the burgers and the fries and they're not going to eat any uh, any of the vegetables and the broccoli. Uh, in fact, I had that battle this evening with a, uh, a, a plate, a, a plate of food, which was fries. There was some chicken and there was, oh, my God, some sweet corn. Oh, that's the end of the world. Um, but anyway, we we uh, we managed to get through that. There was a deal made, as you always have to make a deal on, don't you? And then, you know, and, and we, we got to a, a, the end point. But when, with my kids, if I only fed them broccoli, well, they probably wouldn't eat very much. But likewise, if I only gave them the, the burgers and stuff, then they're not going to get that. They're not going to get the sort of nutrition that they need either. So what we need is something that's going to be both nutritious and tasty. That's that's what our practice should should be like. It should, you know, you're going to get some good at it, but it's got to taste really good and really, really exciting. So we, we need the practice design equivalent of broccoli burgers. This is an actual thing. I got it on the internet. There are re there are recipes. Um, I'm, I've tried a couple, not sure they've got them right yet. Um, and, and interestingly, I think this is my mission, right? With the, the challenge I'm presenting to coaches, the challenges I'm presenting to people out there is how can you design activities and games and these that, that are both nourishing and, and helping with improvement and development and this that, and the other, but at the same time, super tasty. Um, you know, they're going to be like, oh, I want more of that. Let me do more. Let me have more of that. Let me do that. And, that, and then we keep, keep bringing them back every single week and we get that intrinsic motivation and the excitement. So that's the challenge that we're faced with. That's the sort of mission. I use this term play-paration. 
Um, so it's a bit about like play, but it's also sort of preparing. Uh, so it's preparation and play and playing at the same time morphed, morphed into one. I think there's a, there's a word, I think, for um, when you morph words together. I'm not, not sure what it is, but um, I like to do that a little bit. So the, and, and play preparation for me is a bit like, you know, you're going to get you know, yeah, you're going to get some repetition, but it won't be it'll be without repetition. You know, um, uh, you know, you're going to you're going to get people to do the things over and again. So what they're and, and Rick Shuttleworth talks about this a lot. He says you're getting people to repeat the process of finding the solution, not repeat the solution. The process repeat the process of finding the solution, not repeating the solution. Because the solution is pre-given. What we're saying is you're going to find it, but we're going to give you lots of time to have a go at finding it. We're going to keep perception and action coupled. So um I, I, I'm not always sure about the way, use of this language, but what we're saying is, is that we want what people are seeing, feeling, sensing um, to be connected with what they're doing and not desensitizing them from what's around them in the environment and isolating them from that. So it's only them. We see a lot in soccer, for example, people talk about ball mastery and they spend a lot of time in isolated movements, just doing ball mastery without thinking about how do I master the ball in order to avoid uh, an opponent. And so where possible, we're always gonna bring an opponent into the mix so that we can develop their perceptual awareness of what an opponent's doing whilst learning the action possibilities. Um, we, want, we wanna see failure, definitely, but we wanna create an environment that is safe to fail and we wanna foster that. We wanna use designer games. We wanna have a lot of implicit feedback that comes from the game itself. So the feedback doesn't have to come from us. It can come from the game itself and sometimes from the athletes to each other. And we want to try where we can to, to do as much as possible to have a, an idea of co-creation and, and less about correction. Uh, I find that very challenging, I have to say, because I have been brought up on a diet of correction. That's what I do. I look for things that I can correct and improve. And I step in to offer my, uh, my pearls of wisdom. And uh, what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do now, working hard on is uh, working with an athlete on co-creating a possible possible op alternatives. And, uh, and that's uh, quite a dynamic thing and uh, quite powerful, but also quite, uh, quite difficult. So here's a bit of a statement. Technique and skill and all the same now most people are probably going yeah duh yeah of course and, and i know there's a this is a learned group because you're all you've all decided to you know spend your uh uh afternoon evening uh listening to me um and you probably know know that but you'd be amazed at how many people use the term skill uh when they actually mean technique um so you know kind of what's the difference well um the difference between um, uh, skill and technique I'll talk about in a minute, but basically um, skill for me is technique and context. So as I, as I mentioned earlier on, um, a technique applied in context is a skill. And so traditionally the linear approach that um, where I kind of got my learning from and where, you know, we were taught, you know, how to break things down is learn the technique and then apply it into the context and you will become skillful. Well, uh, there's a, another way of looking at this and another body of uh, evidence that suggests that we could do that a different way. And uh, the way we could do it differently is to consider uh, this, what you call a nonlinear approach, where we start with the context first, and then the technique emerges as a response to whatever is in the context. So whatever's going on in the environment that they're in, whether it's a, a practice design of some kind, there is some information taking place. And that information, depending on how the athlete interprets that information, determines um, how they might act. And so what we see is technique becomes an emergent property, because what we're seeing is, is that there's an environment there and people, are, and people are responding to the environment in different ways. And they're developing different movement solutions and different um, uh, you know, movement patterns, utilizing whatever implement that they use in, an arc, in both of, in, in field hockey and ice hockey. It's a, it's a stick. Um, and they're moving, you know, on the ice or on the on the pitch in different ways in order to respond to whatever the context provides them. But in, in this sort of emerging body of evidence, and when I say emerging, it's been around for 50 years, but this body of evidence is suggesting to us that what we need to do is to think about the context first and then enable athletes to uh, explore different techniques as a response to the context. And that becomes very powerful because when you've learned to move in a certain way, utilizing a particular context, um, you it becomes, uh, it, it stays with you because you've learned it understanding the game at the same time. So you become a very 
not only do you become excellent technically, but you become um, excellent technically in relation to what's going on in uh, in the game. And so you become what I call a technician as opposed to a technician. Um, you know, you are able to blend tactic and technique together. So um, one of the, I guess, one of the you know major players, if you like, or one of the major sort of researchers in the space of non-linear, what they call non-linear pedagogy, non-linear coaching, uh, is this uh, absolute gentleman by the name of Keith Davids, who I've been fortunate enough to meet on several occasions and, and has always been extremely generous with his time. He's been on the podcast a few times as well and, um, and very, very learned and very, uh, and very prepared to explore a range of different um, you know, coaching challenges. And one of these, the quotes, one of my favorite quotes he uses is this, this, this quote of, you can't adapt to an environment that you don't inhabit. His point is that, you know, we as humans throughout history have, ad have adapted to our environment. It's kind of what's given us our advantage in, in nature, I suppose. Um, and we've learned to adapt in certain ways. And it's based on this principle, what they call an ecological principle, ecological dynamics, that actually if we can devise different environments and then um, humans can adapt to those environments, then we find ourselves emerging from those environments with different movement solutions. So it's quite an interesting and exciting way of approaching things. But if you're gonna do that, then designing the environment becomes everything. You have to become that kind of a learning architect. Keith talks about a learning architect, creating an environment where learning can take place. And I don't know if you've ever seen Ken Robinson, he's had about 30 million views on, uh, on TED, and he talks a lot about creativity. Um, he's based in the States, um, and, uh, but he's, 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 a, he's a Brit, he's an export. And he just talks about this idea that it's, you know, human flourishing isn't mechanical. You can't predict it. You know, um, all you can do is create an environment or the conditions under which they can flourish. So we have to think like a farmer, not like a not like a machinist. Uh, when we think about creating these kinds of ecological environments that allow uh, young people to flourish. Uh, I use a lot of metaphors, um, as you may have discovered, and uh, I think of I think of uh, learning environments um, like uh, you know, kind of gardens or, or aspects of nature. So if you've ever seen a kind of a Baroque garden or, a, you know, kind of one of those very ordered and structured gardens that, you know, all the hedges are really tightly trimmed and you know exactly where everything is and the herbs are here and the flowers are here and, and, the, and the whatever else, I'm not a gardener, but, you know, over that, I don't know why I use a gardener metaphor. Um, and that's a little bit like where the sort of traditional approach is, where you see it's very controlled, fixed and prescriptive, knowledge is taught and the coach is more like an instructor. Um, but then you can also think of an environment, a learning environment like a family garden, like the garden that I have, where we're all based at the moment. If you've got, if we're fortunate enough to have a garden, I've just been out doing um, lightsaber battles with my kids. We're basically a day late on Star Wars Day, May the 4th, but we found the lightsabers. So our after school club today was uh, was lightsaber battles. There was a few battered thumbs, and but it's interesting how um, uh, I had to be the dark side, obviously. Um, but, you know, we, we managed to, anyway, no more Star Wars. Sorry, I'm, I, all I say is I was victorious, but then again, you know, I am bigger than them. So I suppose I should be. Anyway, um, over to back to the gardens, the family garden, right? It's constrained. So the kids can go, they can do whatever they like in that garden. And if you look at it, you will see that they do. Uh, there's very little grass left, um, but, and they can use all the equipment they want to, and they do. Um, uh, but, you know, it's still safe and framed and it's descriptive and they learn things and knowledge to them is revealed a little bit more by their their discoveries within that garden. And then there's times if I'm their coach where I act as the teacher and I'll say, oh, like, this is so you don't know how to do that yet. Right. I'll show you how to sort of bang this wood together so you can make a seesaw or whatever it is we're going to create on the day. Um, but you can also and they're what you call about the, the content based or the subject based learning um, models where there's something to be learned and the teacher or the coach knows those things and they're going to impart that information to the athlete or player. There's an alternative paradigm on the other side, which is more experience or problem based. So you can have a meadow. Again, a meadow, you know, you can only go so far, but you've got a lot more space to wander. You can be much more creative. It's much more flexible. You can go into different parts of the meadow and explore different parts of the meadow. You can come back to the path if you want to. You could, a lot of choice as to where you want to go. Um, and through that process, you discover a lot about what's in the meadow and how, what you can do in the meadow and the things that are available to you. And if you've got a coach with you, they might be your guide and they might help you go through the meadow and experience different things and take you on a bit of a journey. So it's not completely 
you know, you just on your own, not where you want to go. And then you can think of other learning environments as pure wilderness. They're very chaotic, fluid, explorative, and you're discovering knowledge all the time. And in that case, I describe the coach as a sense maker. And what in that scenario there, the coach is almost saying, I haven't got any necessarily the, any idea of where you want to, where we're going to go. All I can do is to maybe help you make some decisions as we go on the journey together. So you place yourself as a coach alongside the learner. You become a learner with them and you say, right, what do we have around us you, through probing and questioning and everything else? What questions can we ask ourselves? How can we discover things that we're going to be able to help us move through this journey and uh, and make progress and uh, and see where we get to and, and, uh, and what have you? So it's a slightly different approach. Now, I'm not saying any of these, these approaches are better or worse than the others. Um, I just think that the bulk of the coaching that I've done and I learned and I, the education I had was very much on the left-hand side. I'm there to teach something. And my planning and my design was based like that. And now I'm working much more on the other side in the meadow and in the wilderness and trying to place myself in there a little bit more and trying to either be the guide or the sense maker wherever I can. Because what I'm finding is that the athletes, they can be really very young, um, know way more than I, I think, and know may know and can do things uh, way different than I would have thought to. So I found that I was constraining them to far too much when I was operating in the in the Baroque Garden. So um, there's actually a, a really good researcher, James G, um, uh, who's done a, based uh, based in the states, done done loads of work on video games. Um, who, who's pretty influential in this space, but just talks about game design principles. So I wanted to share with you some game design principles that I think are very important and, and, and stay very close to me. So the first one is that, um, you know, um, it, within game design, you know, you need to be like a multi-tool. That, that's like a, you know, a Swiss army knife, right? So that's like a multi-tool. It's not about stabbing people. Um, and we're putting performance before competence, right? And you get an opportunity to learn by doing, you're, you're trying different ways of solving a particular problem. Um, they also want really good games allow players to reach standards in different ways and in different amount of time. So it takes into consideration differentiation and it recognizes that not everybody has to move at the same pace. And if we're not going to move on until everybody's at the same pace, you know, and so um, that's a very important aspect when we're trying to be more inclusive in our practice and take people with different learning needs and a whole range of different, um, you know, kind of experiences. Um, and so a great game allows people to approach the game in their own way and find a way to be successful within it. Um, and then also um, we can foster social interaction through play that's both collaborative and competitive. And that's something that I think is really important is the idea of collaborative play as opposed to the competitive side only. Um, and then the other side as well is um, uh, players are going to face new levels and problems and the challenge, the mastery they've developed. So we're always stretching them just a little bit beyond their capabilities. If you think about any great video game, you know, they're always close. You know, you can nearly get there and you can nearly make a, make an improvement. And uh, and it's just got you just got you hooked. And that's what brings you back. And uh, those kinds of games are really, really smart. And, and if we can create our games to be similar, then we get a lot of stickability. Um, and you get, you know, a really, really rich learning. Um, they also have stories. And so one of the things I've used a lot now is the idea of creating a narrative around my game. Um, you know, so it's usually got a mission or, a, you know, a kind of a, an aim or a, a quest or something along those lines and trying to create an, a, a narrative around the game and then actually encouraging the players to be part of that narrative and create their own stories. Um, and so allow them to have a lot of choice and, uh, and, uh, and then, and actually even discover, we'd like to go here and we'd like to do this. That's super. We'll do that. That's excellent. Let's do that. Or I park that for a second because we're going to come there soon. You're thinking ahead already. Let's just stay here and wait till we get to that moment in the quest or the mission. Um, you see it, right? It's in front of you, right? Because you're designing the game and you can see how they're learning because how well they do when you stretch them later and later. Um, and so you actually get the opportunity to measure their performance. And then also what you'll then see as well is, is that the game design, if it's right, the players actually have to think like designers even to play. They have to figure out the rule system in the game and how it can be used to accomplish their goals. I played a cricket game last year and um, we had a group of players and I gave them the rules and then we create we based it on Fortnite, and they had each, each player had a grenade and the grenade was when you were going to bowl or pitch and, and like in baseball um you hold your grenade and it meant if you got somebody out you kind of got big points 
But if you got it wrong, you also got minus points. And one player, he was the captain of the team, said, I, I said, you haven't used up your grenades. He says, I know, we're saving them all to the end. I've got my best bowler. He's going to deliver all of our grenades. Now, I hadn't said he couldn't do it. And I thought, that's smart. He thought it through. And he went and he got his best bowler to bowl all his grenades. Now, his best bowler crumbled under the pressure and they massively lost the game, but it was a really valuable learning moment for them all. So uh, uh, it was a really interesting experience that I had there. So this concept of representative learning design, um, it's a way I use, it's a little tool or a little framework that I use to help me think about where I want to be in my, uh, in my uh, design. Now, there's like different areas to pay depending on how much information is in the uh, in the you want in the environment, you know how new it is and how novel it is, and how how much it looks like a competitive experience. So, up in the top left-hand corner, you've got lots of new information, um, uh, but it's not particularly representative competition. I call that sort of virtuous variety. That's entertainment. It's fun, right? We're having a great time doing that. You're not necessarily getting a lot of learning out of it. But it's it's a good it's a good time. So that's definitely the kind of burger type experience. Um, and then if you come further down, and we see uh, down down to the left hand side, at the bottom left hand quadrant, you'll see relentless repetition drilling. That's where there's not any information, and there's hardly it doesn't really look like the the competition at all or the game. And then therefore we're just doing something for the kind of almost like for the sake of doing it, right? Now there may be a role for that, but I mean I I struggle to see what it is, and I desperately trot to be in that space um, but the, there are some contexts where that might be appropriate so I'm not going to say that's not the case I just think it needs to be um, very very liberally used it's it's overused it needs to be used a lot less and then you have the successful stability now that might be where you're very very near to playing in your competition you don't want to do anything too much too new you don't want to destabilize the athlete too much you just want them to sort of repeat something Think, but you'd put them into a context that's as close to the competitive environment as possible so they're almost going through that dress rehearsal um, but you don't want to stretch them too much so they're going to feel like oh god oh god i can't do this anymore you want to maintain confidence levels and the area that i tend to try and operate in the most uh, is the top right quadrant the desirable difficulty because that's rich with learning and i'll flex my my activities somewhere going towards virtuous variety sometimes more towards successful stability but generally speaking just trying to get the stretch point right uh, around that desirable difficulty so there's always some learning in place now i'm working with young athletes in the main and you know it's about a learning journey and i'm never that bothered about competitive demands on the weekend i'm fortunate i don't have to be bothered about that um so and i believe in a 10-year learning journey and i think we're going to get some really good outcomes as a result of that so i'm trying to stay in that space where possible and not get dragged into oh we've got to do this this week because we need to win on the weekend but i understand that's why that's how some people have to work i'm just sharing with you my 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 model this idea of the funnel of variability is another tool I used. And this is where I give you the typology of practices. In field hockey, I use these terms. They might be resonate. They might resonate with you. A full game, a small sided game, unit play, variable practice, opposed practice, unopposed practice, and then you drill. Um, the difference between unopposed practice and drill is a drill is where it's completely pre-mapped, whereas an unopposed practice, there's no one to play against, but you can go where you want to. And there might be people in the space, and you might have to avoid them. Now, what you see on the left-hand side is uh, information sources inviting action. They call them affordances. You might have heard that term, but you can just call them what you like. But they're in information sources inviting action. In a full game, there's loads. And as you get closer towards a drill, there's far less. And some of them are mapped out. And it's about trying to find the sweet spot of enough information uh, to be able to allow the players to attend to whatever it is they need to attend to. Um, without overloading them with too information. If you only ever played a full game, there'd be too much going on and they wouldn't necessarily be able to attend to things. So by reducing the information sources down, um, you can actually then create um, uh, an opportunity for them to do more of the kind of repetition without repetition. Um, and they get an opportunity to explore different movement possibilities before moving them back up. Now, with this funnel, one of the things I see a lot of is people um so you know you can use like whole part whole for example where you go full game or something like a small sided game down to say an unopposed practice and you come back to the small sided game well if you look at the amount of information that there is in there it's too much it's too big a jump so i propose to you when you're lining your practices what you might want to look at is small sided game or a full game go go smaller go smaller go smaller go smaller come back come back come back come in little micro jumps maybe over two or three sessions um, you don't have to do everything in the session. And so what I talk about instead of whole part whole or practice play pra or play practice play, 
uh, I talk about um, whole, less of the whole, less of the whole, less of the whole, more of the whole, more of the whole, more of the whole, more of the whole, and design it that way by using little modifications and adaptions. How do I do that? Well, by being intentional about where I am in the space. So are we exploring? Are we exploiting? Are we ex executing? If we're exploring, then there's lots of opportunities for action. We're going to discover lots of different things. Then we might narrow down and begin to exploit. We're going to execute. And that can happen in one session. Or we can spend a whole session exploring. Then we can refine down to another session where we might say, well, we're going to select a few things that we discovered in exploration. You try and exploit them and become better with them. And then we're going to go into a full-on execution phase. And then we're going to go into competition. And this is just a little framework that I use to help me think, right, where am I? And what am I trying to do in this session? Or what am I trying to do in this part of the session? And then I also use this little idea of like a mixing desk. You know, coach is a DJ. I like to think of myself as a DJ. I'm not a DJ, but I like to think of myself as a DJ. And I like to think that I'm, I've got a mixing desk and I'm going to live in the moment. I'm going to change with my mixing desk. Um, I'm going to use space, task, equipment, and people. So think of step, right, as an easy remi reminder. How can I measure, what can I do with space? How can I change the shape? The size, um, the way people interact in that space. What can I do within that within that world? What can I do with a task? Uh, can I change the rules? Can I change uh, what they're trying to achieve? Can I change the mission? Can I change uh, what 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 they're able to utilize with it? What aspects of the way they're able to move within that within that environment? What can the opponents do that the um, that the one team can't do? What can the in possession team do that the that the out of possession team can do? What can we do with equipment? How can you constrain the use of equipment? I quite often play a lot of games where you can only use the forehand side of, you know, we turn a stick over in field hockey, but I play a lot of games where you can only use the forehand, only use the reverse hand, use a, a bigger stick, a bigger ball, a different type of ball, a tennis ball. And what can we do with the people in the space? How can we constrain them? Can we limit their movements? Uh, can we limit the number of them? Uh, can we give them individual challenges and tasks to determine what they can do? Can we make them superheroes? Can we give them super, you know, kind of superpowers? Um, and all these different ideas that I put into my game design and I'm flexing throughout the session as I'm trying to tweak it to get that stretch point just right. So this is a bit of a planning model that I use. This is a game I call, which is called Elimination Extravaganza, which I delivered Sarah Kelleher, who's uh, absolutely amazing. Um, she's the under 18s field hockey coach, national field hockey coach for the under 18 girls. Absolutely off the scale, amazing coach. Been on the show a couple of times. Highly recommend uh, checking her out. Um, and um, we designed this game and it was about creativity and it was about elimination. And you can see as you look through the page, I've, I've determined where I'm going. I mean, I'm pure exploratory. There's going to be loads of variability. It's going to be really quite representative, not fully representative, but quite representative. I've determined impor importantly in the session outcome what the problems that I want the play. I'm, I'm thinking that the players might need to solve. So I'm not thinking about the, the, the movements they might need to do or the solutions they might have. It's the problems that they need to solve. And then I'm designing the game activity in the whole. And then the, the, the part element and then what communication we might use and what differentiation tools and how we might engage them. And then what constraints I might use and what attractors I might use. A constraint is where you limit movement and attractor is where you um, put something in place that encourages a particular movement. An example of that might be you might you might say, oh, you've only got three touches. That's a constraint. On the other hand, you might say you get a bonus point if you can move the ball on within three touches it's a subtle difference but you'll be amazed at how different it is in terms of the behavior of the athletes so just to give you a few examples of what's going on in the garden at the moment a game to a game so this is where this is my little boy we're playing hockey hockey squash we've already played a game of hockey squash and now he has decided to take it upon himself to work on a few actions and you can see him sort of working together improving trying to practice so he's got his own little game and his own little game here is he's trying to do as many consecutive good ones as he possibly can you see he's now starting to improve see how he's getting better right and now we're in the game and this is when he gets us a, a lesson and a schooling from his mean old man but he's starting to do different movements <laughs> and it's fun and we played that for a couple of hours um and that's just because we're sort of limited but then you know you can create all sorts of different games this is a game he invented for himself we've got quite a fairly small garden and he created he's found this piece of wood and he's right i'm going to do this like long jump challenge completely of his own making and then he said to me, how can I get better? And I start to just throw a few constraints in. Here's a few examples. So 
I put a little bit of wood there just to see if I can encourage him to sort of stretch out further. But you really put him off. He found it quite challenging. But he, you can see he's really working through it. He's trying to find his footing. He throws his footing off because he's trying to find the right way to land. He got the wrong foot. So he's discovering things. I'm not saying a word. I'm just filming. Nope. No. Discovering, learning. He asked me, do you think I need to go back further? Do you think I need to run up better? No. Do I pace it out? Um, so we explored a few of those things and we discovered different things. Then I put this box in the way to make him jump higher. That was the first go. That was a little bit scary for him. Freak him out. Um, and this this is something we did for an hour and a half on a, it was a weekend. Um, there we go. That's, that's where I am. I just wanted to leave enough time for questions. I've gone on for far too long. We haven't got an awful lot of time, I'm afraid. But if you want to find out more about what I'm doing, head over to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the site. You can get involved there and you can catch me on Twitter and I'm talking about loads of things. And now I will stop sharing. That was really, really great, Stuart. I, I liked how you put the uh, videos of your son in there. I was going to bring that up. I, I, he's, I my saw... any, he's my N equals one experiment, the poor boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what kids are for. Yeah. Uh, so we got one question from uh, Coach Lucas. He was, uh, and you brought it up a little bit within your, um, your talk, with creating games for kids during practice, how many times have you left the kids left it up to the kids to create their own games and and you suggest rules for the game so i know you you brought it up with the games design that's of how often um yeah i do I do a bit of both actually um um sometimes i will what i've found though is is it is that um that it's, it's quite difficult for them initially uh, they're not kind of used to it uh so i sometimes have to act as a little bit of a stimulus but there's been times when i've started with a kind of little uh, like an informal, just sort of, you know, kind of an, a, a starter, an arrival practice, because they're all arriving at different stages. So it's like a little arrival game and off they go. And then that's morphed into something else. And I've just gone with it. Um, so I do that quite a bit. Um, uh, in general, because of the problem solving, it happens anyway, um, it, whether I start the game or whether the game emerges as something else, because the athletes are saying to me, what if we did this or what if we did that? Um, I've encouraged my son to get involved in game design, but he comes up with some of the things that are so complicated that it's like almost impossible to design. But but one thing I would say as a little tip for everybody as well is if it takes you longer than 10 minutes, sorry, 10 seconds to describe your game, it's too complicated. So whatever the game is you want to get to, fine. Start really, really simple and then add levels in, level two, level three, level four, level five, and then you eventually get to your big complicated game, but they feel like they've just flowed into it. Uh, and it helps you get going really quickly as well. That's that captivating video game design that kids just want to keep coming back to, you know. So, you know, one week to the next, uh, I think that's one of the things that we see is some of our coaches just aren't patient enough. They want to get to the solution. I know I, I can be that way as well. Yeah. So, you know, you have to let the kids have some, you have to have patience, let them solve some problems. They'll get to it as long as you are willing to step back and, let them explore a bit. Um, oh, uh, I mean, and that's a good out. point. That's a good point, actually, is um, we do get a bit hooked on trying to get somewhere in the session. Yeah. And and when you're working in this way, sometimes you have to allow it to marinate. You know, it's like a good sauce, you know, let it, let it, let the flavor come out, let it get, and then it, it eventually, so sometimes you stay with it for a little while and then it, and then, you know, you're tweaking, emerging, you're adjusting, you're making little adaptations and then you see this breakthrough coming and it doesn't always happen then and there. I actually used to love, used to go like, like it if the kids used to go away all with smiling faces. Now I like it if they're just a little bit disgruntled, you know, cause it means they're thinking about it, you know, they're mm -hmm. not quite there. Can't wait to get back. Exactly. So, uh, Sue, I know you, you talk a, a little bit about constraints and kind of um, you have the attractors within the presentation, but I think sometimes we're, we're constraining to just to constrain. Yeah. And I know mm -hmm. you've, you've gone on a couple, you know, talks on that. Can you kind of chat about, you know, that topic? Well, this goes back to the point about intentionality or being intentional, right? So if you're clear about what you're trying to do in your session, so for example, what's the problem? that we're trying to solve, what kind of information should be present in the environment to enable the athletes or players to, to sort of, they, it's the clues they're going to get. Yeah. So the information are the clues, right? And what I feel like sometimes I'm doing is I'm, I'm kind of narrowing down the available possibilities so that the clues become more obvious. 
Now, uh, if you're intentional about that, what you then do is you put constraints in that that uh, allow allow the players to see where the clues are. Uh, you may even sort of direct attention sometimes into those spaces, right? But you're sort of guiding the where they're searching and where they're looking for the problems. Sometimes, though, if you're constraining to constrain, then all you're, you're not doing that. All you're doing is you're creating a limitation. Now, it may be that you're creating a limitation to bring about a behavior change. That's okay, but it's more powerful if that constraint is there to draw attention to where solutions might be found. Now, it takes a bit of doing and a bit of working through, and you find yourself adjusting sometimes in the activity. So that's one thing you do have to understand as well. Rarely does the activity go according to plan. You're nearly always adapting on the fly to tweak it, change it, flex it, put new rules in, because there's sometimes the kids just don't see it. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, could you not see the clue? That's just right in front of your face. But they're in the game and they can't. So you have to sometimes pull out. You have to sometimes make the attractor so strong. So like sometimes you're going like 10 points if the ball goes into this zone. And, you know, and it's like, and even then that's not strong enough and attract 25 points, you know, <laughs> but that's an attractor. That's what gets them to think about where they might need to move and coordinate in order to be able to success, be successful in the game. And I know you, you've, you've hit on and kind of my thinking was when constraining to afford you, if we want to work on offense, you're constraining the offense, but really it's the opposite. You want to maybe constrain defensive situations to promote more offense. Can you kind of talk about that? Yeah, so um, it, I, it's, a, it's an obvious thing, isn't it? And I, I've done this myself. I'm quite an attack-minded uh, coach. So I quite often will work you know, with the attack and we'll create all sorts of great ideas about how we're going to, you know, these poor sap defenders and, you know, we're going to score loads of goals. I've, done it, I've been doing it wrong for a while. If I want the attack to become really good at attack, I give the task to the defenders. Because what I'm looking for is for the attacking group to adapt and react to what the defenders are doing. So for example, if a group of defenders coordinate in a certain way and create this really compact zone and they're like playing in like kind of half press and they're making it very difficult for them to be broken down, that creates an attacking adaptation. They need to shift the ball to space. They need to move it with pace. They need to be intentional in that. Their movement ahead of the ball needs to be really good. Um, you know, or, or, or uh, conversely, if I, for example, overload the defending group and say, right, uh, you guys are going to go on a like, super aggressive press really high up the field, that creates the in-possession group with a different task. They've got to then deal with that, find a way to counterattack, find a way to find a space behind. So one approach to that is to think about, um, almost think in reverse and give the tasks to the other side to bring the and the best the best bit about that is you actually get then the best of both worlds because your defensive group get really good at stuff <laughs> and then the attacking group get really good at like working that out i've seen this before right we need to switch this on so your tactical planning emerges as a result of that it's what they call a share a shared affordances they actually develop a connection and a share and almost like an implicit understanding of how to deal with that scenario because they've seen it before um, and you don't have to shout on the sideline, they're doing a deep press, you've got to move out and spread out. And not, you know, you know, when you shout into yourself and no one can hear you. And that horrible moment <laughs> that we've all been there, you know. And when they do it for themselves and they work it out and you hear them saying it and you hear them connecting with each other, spread wide, eagle, or whatever, whatever codes you've used, then you know you've got a team that's really going to be quite skillful and very difficult to beat. So we did have a couple of questions that came in from the audience. We got one from Chi out west, and I think some. A lot of coaches that operate like this have done a good job in designing games and, and they really want to structure their practices like this. But what are the comments that you've seen from parents about these types of practices? And then how do you answer them? Because it just looks so different than what their expectations are. Yeah, it's the most common question I get. Um, and because it is so different from what's expected, most parents are looking for something that looks a bit like school, I think, you know, that's what they're paying for. They're looking for structure, order. It's got to be neat, tidy. You know, there's got to be cones everywhere. Beautiful. Whistles, clipboards. I'm in. I'm all in. I'm handing over my money and I'm happy. And then you go along to one of our sessions and it looks like chaos and everybody just arrives and balls are flying everywhere and they're all having, you know, it's like, whoa. So I do think it's, I do think if you think that you can just expect parents who are very important stakeholders 
and very you know emotionally invested in their child's experience with you know not all of them are necessarily there to, because they want their, ch their children to be world beaters some are but but some are also there because they want to have a really good time to learn something and and go away with a you know decent experience um to think that they shouldn't be involved in understanding something about the experience that you provide the product you have to offer it's a bit you know it's not really on is it you know you wouldn't do that to any other customer scenario come and buy my magic elixir uh, what does it do you don't need to know um how does it make you make you better you don't need to know that either just buy it and trust me no it's not right is it you're a snake oil salesman if you do that so i think you've got to bring them on the journey and i talk about selling the why a lot uh we have like a in my club we have like a document that basically says we work this way uh i think it's on my website somewhere in the documents area we work this way um, and this is what you will expect. This is what you should see. Uh, we do it for these reasons, um, and we, you know, believe in this in this uh, wholeheartedly. Um, if you ever see us deviate from this, please tell us. If you ever see, if you have any challenges, please tell us. This is what you know. We we, we want you to hold us accountable to providing the best possible experience possible. We also hope you will uh, be held accountable to ensure that you know you do the things that you need to do because there's a bit of a deal here, uh, behaviorally, and also the children's expectations on that. And um, and I've I've been very fortunate, I think, that um, most people who come in have bought in. I know I've lost a few because that's not what they've expected, so they've gone elsewhere. That's no problem. I'm happy with that. Um, uh, but you know, that's that's what your you know that's our environment. And I know lots of other coaches do have to have had similar challenges as well in other sports where they constantly feel like they're having to almost like sell the why, sell the why. But you know what? I think that's important and eventually we'll get past that and then people will be like expecting it to look this way weirdly though i found now what i'm finding is is that um is that a lot of parents get involved as well this is a really good recruiting recruitment vehicle for coaches so we need volunteers we need helpers and i've had some some parent coaches a bit afraid of getting involved so oh, i don't know enough i'm not technical enough this that and the other and i said yeah but you, you can referee a game can't you and if I was to ask you to change the rules a little bit, just to make it a bit easier or harder, you could do that, couldn't you? And they go, yeah, no, that's it. What? That's it. Oh, I can do that. And then we get, and then I get them in. And then that's the end of their lives because I've got them hooked into my world. <laughs> um, so we got a question from coach Doug. Uh, he, he was wondering about, do you have example activities in the desirable difficulty learning category and the successful stability performing category. Do you re recommend spending more time in, de in the desirable difficulty area? So again, um, that, that is based on um, kind of my context. So my context is predominantly a learning context and I'm in on this sort of ongoing learning journey with athletes and therefore I'm looking to try and create something with the desirable difficulty built in. Uh, I never want it to be too easy for them. I want them to always be an element of stretch. Some, that's not always true. Sometimes I'll, I'll make it, you know, we'll just, we'll play, you know, we'll have, have fun. When it comes to the stability side, that's usually where I'm going to do something that they've seen before um, and they've done before. So we might play a scenario game um, that they know what it is. And I'll say to them, right, we're going to do Barcelona today. And they'll know exactly what the game is and they'll go into the game and they'll have seen it before and they'll know how to play it and they'll know what they're trying to achieve. There's nothing necessarily new and they know there's a particular outcome they're working towards and we, we work on those sorts of things. And it's really because I want them to just, that's usually something I'll do as a preparation activity for maybe a competitive event we've got coming up. I don't want to load them in with too much stuff. I don't want to load too much learning. Just want to get them to refine things that they've done before. Um, we did a, an activity prior to a tournament we were in, which was all about designed. It was all about designed around how we coordinate our counter press. So how can we trap the opponents in certain areas to launch counter presses? And they've done it before. They'd seen it before. That's what we were trying to achieve. Um, so, uh, interesting question from coach Tim. He was like, when creating games for kids and you have a, a wide variety of skill levels or in your yeah. group, do you yeah. put them together or similar abilities or do you let them figure it out on their own? And how do you deal with that? Um, a bit of both. Um, I, I'm a big believer in like, you know, it's not one size fits all, uh, in general, it's mixed in general. Um, it sort of self-selects to a certain extent because when they partner up for certain like one-to-one -one activities, they often partner up with somebody who is of a similar ability, which sort of naturally sort of 
creates itself. If I see mismatches, I'll often, sometimes I'll change things so that, you know, one person isn't just being trounced by another. Um, when it comes to game activity, sometimes we will break up into separate groups, but more often than not, we'll try and keep it together. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, uh, particularly with um, uh, young individuals who are on a, you know, we've got different developmental trajectories. I'm not a big fan of setting out a, thing you're in the a squad you're in the b squad you're in the c squad because that creates some uh, what i call like almost like a, a double-edged sword of challenges the a squad think hey i'm the a squad i'm i can do things then you start to see some really dangerous behaviors and they start almost thinking that they don't necessarily have to work quite as hard and the c squad think well i'm never going to be as good as the a squad and then they go through that kind of self-fulfilling uh, mentality of oh, I'm never going to get there but actually it's really just usually it's about experience levels some some have been playing longer some have got older brothers who they've been battered by and they've got better as a result of that and they've had a lot more game time some have got parents who've played before so they've played so it's just experience levels so we try and mix it up wherever we can and what you find then is is that you see kids really accelerate out of nowhere and um, because they've been able to mix it with the kind of more able kids, we do quite a bit of mixed age group stuff as well. So we don't always train in the same age. I'll bring, I'll, I'll, I'll throw the twelves up with the fourteens. I'll throw some of the fourteens in with the twelves. We'll mix up the teams so that you've got some twelves and fourteens working together. Um, sometimes I'll play the twelves against the fourteens. Um, I'm working with that age group at the moment, so we do try and mix it up. Um, and it's not an exact science. Um, they do compete in their age group, so that's just the way it is. But I'm never that fussed about that. Um, and actually, what I find is they get some really interesting challenges by – it's quite interesting when you see a group of under-14s get – annihilated by a group of under 12s and what happens to their kind of mentality and how everything goes out the window and the stress they're under uh, there's something really valuable about that as a learning experience i wouldn't recommend it all the time um but it does work sometimes so yeah we very much mix it up it's a very mixed diet That's great. um so i I've, I've been we probably have maybe two more questions one as a coach and we were talking about decisions that these players are making during the game and that's, you know, having the context. Can you count the count, the amount of decisions that they're making um, in a game? Do you think no. You no. Well, there, um, there's some really good research on this about um, what they call ultra fast cognition because the decisions aren't observable. Not all of the decisions are observable and not all of the, um, uh, not, not everything that's happening within a human organism um, necessarily uh, comes out in behavior. So we can see a relatively small amount. Well, we can infer decisions. So we can think that an individual may have acted in a certain way based on a certain source of information. But more often than not, what we're trying to do is we're trying to equate our perspective on theirs. We're not, we can't see through their eyes. So we can't see the amount of decisions that are being made. That are being made. We know if an environment is more decision rich than another, it's obvious by the way it's designed. And we're looking for decision-rich environments wherever we possibly can. Um, uh, but also, when it comes to cognition, there is this idea that um, you know it's not just about the brain. The entire body is involved in decision-making process because we we feel, we sense. Um, you know, how many times have you um, been? You know, you, you like been in involvement, and you just sort of sense that something's there, even though you hadn't seen it. You knew it before it was there. It's all that we're tapping into, and that's linked to the decision-making process and part of that kind of cognitive process. And that level of awareness is a really interesting area that I'm exploring at the moment, which is how can I devise an environment where I'm looking at how the athlete is aware? How aware are they of what's around them? And what are they utilizing to raise their level of awareness beyond just their eyes? You know, what can they hear? What can they feel? What can they sense? What, what are they creating through connection? And that's a really interesting area. There's a lot of research, a lot of research emerging on that. Um, that's that's if you if you're a particular geek like me and you want to delve into, and it's it's heavy duty. But there's some very interesting stuff out there about that. How do you facilitate asking those questions to those athletes and getting the feedback from them? Ah, well, that's good, good one, right? So a number of different ways. I used to play the whole uh, coach guessing game, right? So I have the right answer. Here is a question. You've got to fire out just words until you get something that makes me look like I'm happy. Communication. 
work together. Ha, oh, you know, they give me all the, it's like a bingo, you know. Um, we've all been there and they cotton onto that one pretty quickly. So I don't play the bingo guessing game anymore. I, quite, I use quite interesting questions, right? So, you know, you've got what they call convergent questions, which are directed towards a particular point, or there's divergent questions where there's any possible answer. So I'm trying to be more divergent with my questioning. So my favorite question, for example, is what did you notice? You can't get, you can't answer that question wrong apart from to say nothing, because it basically then means you haven't really been engaged in the process of what's the information sources. But if they do say nothing, it usually tells me something about my practice design. So um, we talk about. So what I often use is what I might call like a priming question. So I might say um, like, what is this game asking you to do? Or um, how does what is it in the game that you can do that will help you achieve the mission? So they go there with something to consider. So when they come back, I'll say, what did you notice? Well, I noticed this, I noticed that. That's interesting. Right, let's just attend to that thing. Go back in and attend to whatever it is that you've noticed. And then we'll explore in more depth what, what it is about that that you might need to be doing. Um, and so the questions are more linked. They're a little bit like uh, attractor questions. They're like sort of directing gaze, directing search. And what I'm hoping that will happen is that they'll come back to me with that. Now, it doesn't always work because sometimes they, I have been in sessions where it's taken me a whole hour. And I've, I've said, well, what did you notice? And they'll say, uh, we've got to communicate more. And I just sigh a little bit, you know, and go, OK, no, back in again. Think about it again. Right. What is the mission? What are we trying to achieve? What is it in, in this game that you're asking to be challenged by? Off you go. Come back. In. What did you notice? Yeah, we need to communicate more. OK, right. Let's try again. <laughs> I did that for an hour, but it was worth it. Right. And I, I was I was being observed at the time and somebody said, you should have moved it on. You know, they were starting to lose engagement and they were they were struggling. But I, I thought, no, this is worth it. There's value in this struggle. I'm staying there. I'm not going to be afraid of the struggle. Let's stay in the struggle. And we stayed and we stayed. And at the end of it, it started to happen. We started to see it and they started to connect with it. And they came back to me and they said, we see it. We see it now. It's this. Yes, it's that an hour. But, you know, sometimes that's where you've got to be. Ken, do you have a, a question before we we have? No, I would just be respectful of, of Stuart's time here. We've, we've kept him on for an hour and 20 minutes already. So, you know, um, just enjoy our time. Enjoy listening. You may not get to hear us every week, but we certainly get to hear you, which we I think a lot of us look forward to. So just thank you for what you do. Um, well, there's a, there's a show coming out this week, which I highly recommend people listen to a uh, fabulous lady based over on, uh, on the West coast called um, Kathy Sierra, who uh, trains horses using constraints. So uh, how do you, ha how do you help change behavior when you can't talk to, and honestly, it's mind blowing. You know, you might be saying, Oh, horses, whatever. Genuinely, every time, everything she talks about, you think I could do that. I could do that. I could do that. It's really, really, really fascinating. So I uh, highly recommend listening to that one when it when I finally get to edit it and publish it. <laughs> yeah. so, so we usually ask all our guests one question at the very end. If uh, you had a time machine and you went back in time to talk to young Stuart Armstrong, coach just getting started, what would you tell him? Sprung that one on me, Dave. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that in the notes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a doozy. Uh what would I say I to this myself? Is, this is going to have to be part two. I guess you're going to have to come back on. Uh, yeah, well, you're right. No, I, I, I tell you what I would say to myself. I'd say to myself, don't be in such a rush. Um, uh, there's, there's value in the struggle. Um, and I'd also say to myself, get your hair cut. Because <laughs> I'm looking, I'm holding on to whatever I've got right now. But back then, I see some of the photos. Good lord, what? Oh my, ridiculous! Get a haircut. I'd have said to myself, definitely. Okay, awesome. I just want to thank everybody that joined us on USA Hockey webinar series presented by Pure Hockey and BioSteel. Uh, tomorrow we have Dr. Dean Creelars, who's going to talk about player development and effectively putting um, physical literacy within your practice. Uh, design. So that's going to be a great one. He's a world leading expert in physical literacy. Uh, Wednesday or Thursday, we have uh, Steve Thompson, our ADM manager for goaltending. And then on Friday, we have Seth Appert, coach of, the, coach of our U.S. national team development program team. And he's going to talk about practice philosophy. So really great. Stuart, 
uh, like really, really appreciate your time. You know, much appreciated. Um, I feel My like pleasure, with, guys. A, with 142 episodes, I know you, I, we speak to you every, every week. I just don't talk. So it's very normal. So um but thanks absolutely again. absolutely my pleasure and i absolutely love the work you're doing so i'm just glad to be a little part of it thank you awesome thanks everybody we'll see you tomorrow